If you would, take your Bibles and turn to Exodus chapter number 3. Exodus chapter 3. We have been over the last weeks, have been talking about uh, hearing the voice of God. And that when God comes, 1 Kings 19 says that He comes as a whisper, as a breath. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the term for uh, the name for Jehovah, uh, for God in the Old Testament was Jehovah. But they would not even, uh, or, or Yahweh, they would not even want to put the, uh, to speak the name Yahweh. They thought it was so sacred. So they, they would just take it out. And they, if you took the vowels out, which is how they would do it, they said that the pronunciation of that would, would literally be the breath of God. God breathed. As a matter of fact, uh, in Timothy, we understand that the word of God is God breathed. It is inspired by God. So when God speaks, he has ability to, to, to be heard even if it's in a whisper. And we also talked about how we needed to get to the place where we could get all of the, the, the noise out of the way, all the noise out of our life so we could be quiet before him so we could listen. We learned that when he does speak, he speaks through the Holy Spirit and he wants a relationship with us. And he calls us to a relationship. And it's a wonderful thing when God wants to do great and mighty and glorious things. And he speaks through his word. And I pray that he does that today. But today I want to I talk to you about what is our reaction to his voice? What are we going to do when God speaks? Matter of fact, we need to make up our mind now. Before God speaks. We need to be ready for whatever it is that he has for us to say. Now, let me bring this together real quick. When God speaks, there's going to be two things that he's going to share. Are y'all listening? There will be an assignment and there will be an opportunity. The assignment comes first. But after the assignment, then we get the opportunity. Now, we like the opportunities. As a matter of fact, most of the time when we pray, we're really saying, Lord, do this, or Lord, bless this, or Lord, here's a need. Would you meet the need? And we're looking for the the Almighty God, the God of the universe, to come down. And Matter of fact, we used to sing a song, Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. We're looking for that. We're wanting that. We need that in our life. But, Instead of looking for that which comes from his hand, that's the opportunity. Sometimes we need to understand that when he first speaks, he gives us an assignment. Now, if the opportunity is there, we say, amen, hallelujah, praise God, I just bless your holy name. We like that part. I wish we could be just as excited when he came to us with the assignment. Because there's something that uh, that's God wanting us to do. Now, God can do anything, but he wants to draw us. He wants us to be part of it. So sometimes it, it's what I call an if-then. If we will, then he will. Matter of fact, you can go through Scripture, and you'll see that over and over and over again. He'll say, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked way, then I will hear from heaven. And I'll forgive their sins and heal their land. We want the forgiving of our sins. We want the healing of the land. But we forget the the first part, the assignment of what we need to do. So God always comes with an assignment first. And if we're obedient to the assignment, then God will do great and mighty things. The last week we spoke briefly about Exodus chapter 3. And and we talked about how Moses was there on the back side of the wilderness. Are y'all good with the backside of the wilderness? That place that, I mean, what is the backside? I mean, wilderness sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? But he, I mean, he's not only just in the wilderness, he's on the backside of the wilderness. He's at a place that was a God moment, though. Mount Moriah. He's there, and, and, and he sees something, and, and he's tending sheep. You know, David looked later, and he he penned the words, the Lord is my shepherd. Well, that's what Moses was seeking to do, be a faithful shepherd on the backside of the wilderness. And he sees just an old dried-up bush burning. 
Well, that would be okay. But a dried up bush will burn up in just no time. Y'all good with that? Just a moment, it's gone. But he looks at it and it's still burning. And we don't know how long it was there. Maybe it was 15 minutes, 30 minutes, maybe it was an hour. Maybe it was two an hour, two hours. But he looked up there and the bush was still burning and it got his attention and he went to it. And when he got up close to it, listen to me now, he heard the voice of God. And the first thing the voice said was, hold on, this is special place. This is holy land. Take off your shoes, this is holy land. I've often thought, I wonder if later on if Moses ever went back to the mount there to see if that bush was still there. You know, if we're not careful, we'll look at the place or we'll look at that moment and we'll say, hey, that's the place, that was the moment. And it's almost like we'll, we'll worship that. But let me tell you, any place God is is holy ground. Wonderful times. And it wasn't just that spot. But it's any spot where God wants to come and speak a word to us. And he whispered a word to him. He gave him the assignment and then told him about the opportunity. Look with me in Exodus chapter number 3. Let's look in verse number 7. You there say amen. God speak to us, Lord. Speak clearly today. Look in verse 7. And the Lord said... I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sorrows. Listen to verse 8. I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians. Let me say that again. He is saying, I have come down to deliver them. Did y'all catch that? To bring them up from the land to a, a good and a large land to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Listen to verse 10. Come now therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh. Hold on, verse 8. He said, I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians. But in verse 10, verse 10, he says, Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. God spoke. But when he spoke, his word to Moses was, Listen, first there is an assignment. Now, he probably got excited when he heard about God hearing their prayers and bringing them up out of the oppression of slavery, out of the misery of the taskmasters of Egypt. When Moses was there in the first 40 years of his life, even though he grew up in the house of Pharaoh, he knew he was different. I mean, just look at him and to know the circumstance. And he saw the burdens of of the of the Israeli people. He saw them. As a matter of fact, he went to defend them one time. It got him in trouble. He knew, matter of fact, he ran for his life from Pharaoh. He knew the burdens there. He was excited that God had heard their cries and prayers and that God was going to do a mighty work. He was excited about the fact that God said, I will deliver them out of the hands of Egypt. But first, he said, I've got an assignment for you. I want you to go to Pharaoh. Hold on, Lord. I left there 40 years ago. Why me, Lord? He went on to tell God how God must be mistaken because he couldn't be the one God would use. But God's not mistaken. And when God speaks, he speaks individually. Are you listening? He speaks one heart at a time. He'll speak to you and whisper your name. And he'll say, I have a blessing that I want to do. But listen to this. But first, I've got an assignment for you. We like the opportunity. We're not too thrilled always about the assignment that God may bring us. But just remember, the assignment always comes first. God spoke to a man by the name of Noah. 
Noah, I'm going to bring judgment to the world. But Noah, you're a preacher, and you're a man of righteousness. I want you to preach righteousness and let them know that if they do not repent of their sins, I'm going to bring judgment upon the earth by rain. Okay, Lord, what's rain? It's water from heaven. I've never seen that. Well, it's coming. You see, the earth was kind of like an inverted umbrella. It held all the moisture in the air. There would be a dew on the ground, but maybe a spring there, but, but it, ne it had never rained. But God said, water is going to come from heaven. Matter of fact, yesterday afternoon, did y'all see the water come from heaven? Did it get your attention? I was in a funeral service, and I was coming up the road, and within five minutes, I mean, it poured. And the ditches were filled up, and I'm like, is Noah coming? Right? It just seemed like one of those moments. Listen, build a boat. A boat? Why do I need to build a boat? I told you it's going to rain. And for 120 years, listen to me now, long time, hard time, building a boat, preaching righteousness, no one following. Listen to me. The assignment had to be fulfilled because the opportunity of safety was coming. I wonder about Abraham. God said he'd make him a mighty nation. I'll make your children like the, the sands on the seashore, like the stars in the sky. But first, Abraham, take your son, your only son, by the way, to, mount, to the mountain where Jerusalem would be where the Holy of Holies would be built. Take your son Isaac, your only son, and offer him up unto me. Lord, you want me to do what? I kind of like that you're going to make a mighty nation. Hey, you're going to give me many children? Like the stars in the heavens? That sounds great. But you want me to kill my son? The assignment comes before the opportunity. David. Samuel came and said, you're going to be the next king. But before you get the keys to the kingdom, his daddy sent him back out to the, tend the sheep. One day his dad said, go take your brothers some food. They're down there where they're making war. David goes there. And he hears, I love this, David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine who curses Almighty God. Before David could become king, the assignment of Goliath was there. How could he be faithful as king until he could have first trust God with the assignment that God placed before him? What about Elijah? I want you to go to King Ahab. And tell him, it will not rain until I say so. Now, go to the brook Cherith and wait there. Drink from the spring. The ravens will bring you food. First, he had to be obedient to the assignment before he could have the blessings on Mount Carmel when God would send the fire from heaven. And revival would occur. The assignment comes before the opportunity. God always wanted to have a relationship with us. God created us that we may have life and that we would have it abundantly. But there was a, a, a big division between us and God. It's our sin. Something had to take the place of that. And God gave Jesus the assignment to take His cross, to pay the penalty for our sins so we could be saved. Don't you think for a second that Jesus looked forward to the cross? Matter of fact, the night, hours before the cross, He was in the Garden of Gethsemane crying out, Lord, if there's any way possible that this cup can pass from Me, nevertheless, not what I will, but Your will be done. He prayed it once. And he went, it's, the scripture says he went back and prayed it again using the same words. And went back the third time. He wasn't excited about that. 
but he was faithful to the assignment of the cross. And praise God that he was. He came and, and, and shed his blood, paid the price for our sins, gave his life a ransom for my redemption. And he gave his life. They couldn't take it, but he gave it freely. They put him in the tomb, and three days later, he came out faithful. God was faithful with an opportunity of new life, abundant life, everlasting life. He showed himself to the people for 40 days. And then he told them, wait, wait. And they went and waited. They could, they, maybe they wanted to preach. Maybe they wanted to do other things. I don't know. But they did exactly what they were told to. Then came Pentecost. The assignment is before the opportunity. We say, Lord, speak. Your servant is listening. Lord, let me pray, and I'm expecting you to work. God, my family, I read the hymn possible. So many of them had to do with families, with relationships, with brokenness, with help, with finances, with difficulties, with people, with jobs, and all of those things where you said, you said, I have struggled with this. It's so hard. It's so heavy. It, it can't be done. I can't make it happen. I need a breath from God. I need the power of God. And God's in heaven. He knows our thoughts. He hears our prayers. God is so much more willing than we could ever even comprehend. It's the dear church member. The assignment comes before the opportunity. Moses, I want to deliver my people. Now you need to go down there and speak to Pharaoh. You willing to go, Moses? Can I give you a, a word? What would have happened if Moses wasn't faithful to the assignment? What would have happened if Noah for 120 years, had not been faithful to the assignment and built the ark? What would have happened if Abraham was not willing to give up his son, his only begotten son? Would he have found the ram in the thicket? What would have happened if David had not stood up before Goliath? Would he, would, would he have been worthy to stand as God's messenger to the people? If Elijah had not been faithful to go to Ahab, would the fire have happened three and a half years later on Mount Carmel? At Elijah's prayer, would God have not brought rain to the people once again? What if Jesus said, it's not worth it? We used to sing the song, he could have called 10,000 angels. What if he said, I don't want to do it. What if he said, I'm not going to do it? Then I would be here today standing in my sin rather than in, under the blood of Jesus Christ, my Savior and Lord. He was the only one worthy. He was the only one capable. Praise God, he was willing. The assignment comes before the opportunity. Some of y'all are thinking, those are good things. Well, didn't Jesus say to us, deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow me. I wonder, are we going to be obedient to the call of God? I got somebody else I want to talk to you about. Take your Bible and turn to the book of Jonah. Yeah, I'm going to go there. I'm going to pull out. Do y'all like Jonah? Mark likes Jonah. I like Jonah. He was a backslidden preacher. Y'all good with that? Y'all ever met a backslidden preacher? No amens, Jack. My amen corner back there. 
What a wonderful word. You know, when we think about Jonah, we think about the great big fish. Can I just tell you, God had a word for Jonah. Are you there? Jonah chapter number 1. Let's start reading in verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Now, can I just say, amen? God spoke. God had a word for Jonah. It's always a word of blessing. It's always a word of good. It's always great grace, amazing grace. I mean, when God speaks, something good is about to happen. Look in verse 2. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Verse 3. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarsus from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarsus. He paid his fare, went down into it to go with them to Tarsus from the presence of the Lord. That was a, he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get away from God. I don't like this word of God. I'm not going to be obedient to that. I'm going to run. Can y'all run from God? Do you think the still, small whisper from God can find you? Holy ground can find you right where you are? To say exactly what it is we need to hear? He said, I'll go down and get on a, a boat and go to, to Tarsus. Now, for the people in that day, that was like saying, I'm going to go to the furthest city that I can. I'm going to get as far away from God as I can. It, they thought that if you got past Tarsus, you're just going to fall off the face of the earth. I'm going to get as far away as I can. God won't find me there. Does God have a way of finding us? So he gets in the boat and he goes, and God, listen to me now. Blows a wind. Blows a wind up against that boat. You know the story. They row against it. They go to Jonah, why aren't you? He says, that's my fault. It's my fault. I should have listened to God. Throw me over. You know what they did? They threw him over. Amen. Whoosh. And Jonah was trying to get as far away from God as he could. So you know what God did? God sent a fish to find him right there. He took him, and there he was in the belly of the fish. And I don't know what it's going to take for us to get to rock bottom, but Jonah was in the, in the belly of the fish. And you read chapter 2, and he's crying out to God, Lord, maybe I should have listened. You know, it's never too late to have a repentant heart. It's never too late to say, yes, Lord, yes, on this side of eternity, we still have an opportunity. An opportunity. But the assignment comes before the opportunity. So he tried to get as far away as he could. The fish got him there and took him right back to the same place. Gave him heartburn and spit him up on the shore. Now take your Bible and look in chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. Let's begin in verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah. What's that say? Praise God for the second time. Anybody in here need a second chance? Anybody need a third chance or a 22nd chance or a 158th chance? I mean, some of us are a little bit more stubborn than others. Right, man? Maybe sometimes we, we, we pause a little bit too long on the assignment part. But this says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell to you. Does that sound vaguely familiar? Can we go back to chapter 1, verse 2? Is that not just the same exact word that God said before? I mean, there's a lot of time that's elapsed. There's a lot of misery that's lapsed. There's a lot of, of anguish and pain that we go through because we're not quick to say yes to God's Word to us. 
Look in verse 3. This time it says, so Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh, what's that say there? Believed God. Proclaimed a fast. They're getting serious. Put on sackcloths and from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covering himself with sackcloths and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, listen to what the king said, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Be serious about this. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Y'all ready for verse 10? Then God saw their works. Listen, the works are the actions that came based upon their belief. When you believe something, there is something that's going to happen where you're going to now do what you've been saying that you believe needs to happen. It's the corresponding actions that come in our life. Then God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God relented from the disaster that he said that he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. Listen. Church, the greatest revival, the greatest revival in the Word of God is Jonah chapter 3, verse 10. The entire city repented. From the least to the greatest. They heard, they believed. They repented. I mean, they fasted. They sat in that, uh, sackcloth and ashes. Even the king. And God saw that and gave them the opportunity of blessing. The assignment must come, but the opportunity follows. Now, I've been talking a lot about the assignment. Y'all listening to me? Now I need to talk to you about the opportunity. The word opportunity is a nautical term. Ob, really O-B, portuna. We put them together till we get this term, opportunity. And this is what this nautical term means. It's when the sail is set and the perfect wind comes up and hits the sail in the right way, listen to me now, to take you to the destination that you want. Opportunity. When the sail has been set and the perfect wind comes against the sail that is able to take you to the perfect destination. The blowing of the wind of God. But first, we've got to set our sail. Doesn't do us any good to set the sail unless God blows the wind. And we pray, Lord, come. Lord, we need you. All is vain unless the Spirit of the Holy One comes down. Lord, unless you do it, it can't be done. But if we're faithful to the assignment, God's always faithful in the opportunity. So when Noah built the boat, did the rain came? Just like God said it would. 
Did God keep them safe? Absolutely. Absolutely. God gave them the blessing. Did Abraham take his son up on Mount Moriah? Yes. Did he take up the knife ready to kill his son, his only son? Yes, he was faithful to the opportunity. But God already had the sacrifice, the alternate sacrifice prepared. What about David? Was David faithful? Yes. Did Goliath fall with a thud? Can y'all say amen to that? Was Elijah faithful? Yes, he was. Was God faithful? Fire came from heaven, consumed the altar. God heard their prayer. Rain came. He's a faithful God. Jesus went to the cross. He shed his blood. So a 10-year-old boy could hear the call of God, repent of his sins, ask God to do for him what I could not do. He heard my prayer, saved my soul. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Am I perfect? No, but I am forgiven. And if you're sitting here looking at me, God's got a word for you. God has an assignment for you. When your job is done, when your assignment's over, you won't be looking at me, you'll be looking at Him. But there's a work to be done today, folks. Are you willing for the opportunity? Do you want God to come and blow against our sails to take us to our future destination? Yes, Lord, yes. Well, then let's say yes to the first word. There was a, a young nun, just a small, frail young lady, but she heard the God, of, God call upon her life. God told her that He wanted her to minister in a foreign place and build an orphan. So she went to her priest, her name was Agnes, and said, God has spoke to me and God has given me this assignment. God has put this call on my life. And all I have is three pennies. And the priest did what probably most of us would do. Honey, you and three pennies can't build an orphanage. We now call her Mother Teresa. She found her Calcutta, where she went and built that orphanage. She went and ministered on the streets. She washed the feet of lepers. And the presidents and the kings of this world looked up to her to give her praise. A 90-something pound nun with three pennies got the Nobel Peace Prize. You can't get from a nun with three pennies to the Nobel Peace Prize unless you're first obedient to the assignment and then the opportunity comes. We want Pentecost without waiting for the power of God. But we've got to set ourselves. We've got to say, even so come Lord Jesus. And let the Holy Spirit come. And blow against us. We've got to be willing to be a fool for Christ. Christ. So that we can have the blessings of Almighty God. God has spoken to me. And I'm here to tell you, I'm willing to be called a fool for Christ. And I will be called a fool for Christ. In the weeks that are ahead, you're going to look at me and you're going to say, that man's lost his, he's, he's lost his 
marbles, but that's okay. If you're faithful to the assignment, listen to me, I can't make the winds of God blow, but I can set the sail and wait for God to do what only God can do. And He can use people even like us if we'll say yes. How many times have we heard the sermons? How many times have we heard the story of Jonah? What is it going to take for us to say, yes, Lord, even so come, Lord Jesus. I don't know your circumstance. I don't know your burden. I don't know what brought you to this place today in your heart and in your life. I don't know if you need the first chance or the 158th chance or the 7,232nd chance. It doesn't matter to me. Are you ready to say yes to the assignment so the opportunity can come?